Welcome to the Elden Conspiracy, the channel where I do unhinged lore speculation about the game Elden Ring. When attempting to form a timeline of the history of Elden Ring's world, very few details are made known to us. Fewer still when it comes to ascertaining the time before the Erd Tree. My intention here is to expand on the ideas presented in the lore, to come up with an accurate picture of the history of Elden Ring's fictional world. George R. R. Martin wrote a certain document, outlining much of the game's backstory. I'm trying to find out as much as I can about specific details of this document. I don't care so much about symbolism, only insofar as it backs up other theories based on hard evidence. Many of my ideas here may seem out of left field. But I hope I provide enough evidence to back up my conjecture, though minimal it may be. After defeating the optional boss, Dragon Lord Placidasax, his remembrance tells us he was Elden Lord before the age of the Erd Tree. The line, once his god was fled, has fascinated lore hunters since release. Who was this mysterious god? Placidus X was Elden Lord. Could it be that his fled god was the Marika to Placidus X's Godfrey, an Empyrean vessel of the Elden Ring? Could this statue in Malachi's boss room be this Empyrean? Is it the Glomide Queen? Is it Marika? Was Marika the Glomide Queen? I can't give you a definitive answer to any of these questions. What I can do is examine the physical evidence and give, in my mind, the most plausible theory about Placidus Axe's reign. In this video, I'd like to introduce the theory that Placidus Axe had not one, but several consorts across multiple ages. Being an ancient dragon and thus immortal, Placidus Axe could theoretically live through the lifetimes of several vessels of the Elden Ring. I came to this conclusion after seeing unmistakable evidence that Placidus Axe had contact with multiple civilizations over an enormous span of time. Any claim that Placidus Axe had one particular consort could just be countered by the easily obtainable evidence of a different candidate. So therefore, the only possible conclusion is that these were all consorts at some time or another. Of the many decorations of Ferrum Aslo's architecture, the Twin Bird is one of the most prominent. The way this emblem is put directly above the entrances to buildings suggests it has a place of reverence in the early religion of Ferrum Azala. The Twin Bird is a guardian deity, protecting the way for the faithful. In the overworld of the Lands Between, one can encounter bosses known as Deathbirds, said to be children of the Twin Bird. The power they use, Ghost Flame, has a unique ability to cause frost buildup. The only other enemy who uses this are the soldiers of the Fallen Hawk we encounter in the eternal city of Nokron. The Deathbird bosses drop various weapons and talismans whose descriptions talk of an ancient religion. Wherein warriors offered themselves to the Deathbirds as sacrifices after performing feats in combat. These item descriptions have fueled many discussions over the possible land of the dead, or spirit world, where the spirits of the dead roam. We know the priests of the Deathbirds await a resurrection of some kind. There are several examples of resurrection in Elden Ring alone, and many more in the Soul series as a whole. This is very similar to the situation of the Tarnished, as well as those who live in death, and the worship of the Eclipse. Does this mean the Twin Bird's influence still exists in some way? It's hard to tell. The principal item of Twin Bird lore is the Twin Bird Kite Shield, found in Alsus Plateau. The Twin Bird is described as Mother of the Deathbirds, and is also the envoy of an Outer God. Going off my last video, this would make the Twin Bird a possible Empyrean. In that case, a possible lord would be Dragonlord Placidasax. That we see twin bird related evidence in both locations suggests prior influence of the wider civilization of Farum Azala on the lands between going back a very long time. Around Farum Azala, you can encounter bestial skeletons, using the same exact equipment as those who live in death on the mainland. Both enemies have a chance to drop the Sun Realm Shield, an item vital to understanding this theory. The shield's description talks about a seat of the sun, which has since long faded away. Many people will take this to mean Ferrum Asla, since there the sun never sets. However, the castle towers depicted on the shield look nothing like Ferrum Asla architecture, so what gives? I believe the actual seat of the sun was situated in the lands between. There you can find similar looking towers and castles. The fact that the Sun Realm shield can be found from both human skeletons and bestial skeletons suggests a time in the far past when the two civilizations, Sun Realm and Ferrum Azala, were allies. This alliance could have been predicated on the union between Placidus Axe and the Empyrean of the Sun from the Sun Realm. I know I'm just making up characters to suit my narrative. But I think it is a plausible extrapolation. 
from the other Empyreans we hear about. If there can be an Empyrean of the Moon, like Roddy, why not an Empyrean of the Sun? I believe the seat of the Sun, mentioned in the Sunrealm Shield description, is most likely Castle Sol. Sol is the Latin term for Sun. The transition to Eclipse worship happened after the Sun was somehow lost. It is important to note here that the Sun is never visible from the mountaintops of the Giants. But you can still see it in the water. Maybe it's a dead oversight. In Commander Nial's boss room, you can find a design on the ground. This matches the same design at the Tempest Viewing Balcony, the site of Grace in Faram Azala. The same design also shows up on the Great Faram Bridge. Besides the shield, this indicates some past cultural interchange between Faram Azala and the Sun Realm. In Faram Azala, you can see the sun, extremely bright and frozen in the east, never rising or setting. This, juxtaposed with the complete absence of the sun in the north, could symbolize Placida Sex's theft of the sun from the sun realm of Castle Sol. This could coincide with the abduction or death of a sun Empyrean, since the fate of the Empyrean and their spirit are linked. In a previous video about the Stormhawk clan, I said this about their connection to the Banished Knights. Both of these show that the Banished Knights did not originate in Stormvale or the Stormhill region, but rather the Altus region making them a distinct group from the Stormhawk clan. I may have to revise my theory. After seeing the very clear signs of Stormhawk involvement in Faram Azala, the fact that actual Stormhawks are here, that the ancient storm is here, and also the inclusion of Banished Knights, and also in the light of new evidence, I now acknowledge the Banished Knights and the Stormhawk clan were once one culture that was allied to Faram Azala in the distant past. This new evidence has to do with the Banished Knight armor and how it is altered. The helmet with the dragon is the altered version, implying the version without the dragon is the original design. Note that wearing the unaltered Banished Knight helm also removes the horn on the shoulder, effectively removing all signs of dragon imagery. Also, the fact that the scarf worn on the unaltered helm is a flag from Stormvale Castle firmly proves the point that the Banished Knights were not originally allies of the ancient dragons but rather after the alliance was formed, they decorated their gear with horns of dragons to show the allegiance to their new lord. It is possible the alliance was sealed with the union between Placida Sax and the Empyrean of the Ancient Storm from Storm Vale. Again, I know I am just making up characters. Granted that Nefeli herself experiences a connection to the storm, not unlike the connections other Empyreans feel toward their respective spirits. There is a strong possibility that one of Nefeli's distant ancestors was this Empyrean of the Storm. Most likely, the wife of the Storm Lord was one of the same blood, since we established in the last video that the title of Lord is granted to a man who marries an Empyrean. The last piece of evidence is the presence of the ancient storm in Faram Azala itself. While it is not mentioned directly in text, it only suggests that Faram Azala was struck by a meteorite. The tornadoes holding Faram Azala aloft and trapping Placidus X in time could only be the ancient storm talked about in Stormhawk Dean's Ashes. The reason the storms are here has to be related somehow to the Empyrean of the ancient storm. The next possible consort that comes up frequently in lore discussions is the Glomide Queen. Like Marika, she was an Empyrean, and was also around before or near the beginning of the Age of the Erd Tree. She definitely could have been Placida Sex's consort. They were both, broadly speaking, around before America's age. Except I don't think the evidence is as solid as people typically think. While we do encounter the Godskin duo boss fight in Faram Azala, we don't really see anything which would indicate a definitive link between the two societies. If the Glomide Queen was Placida Sax's consort, we would see more indications in the environment, in the standard enemies of the area. For example, seeing beastmen use black flame incantations or black flame monks anywhere in the area, but we see none. We see no black flame or Glomite Queen flavored items anywhere in Faram Azala. I think people jump to this conclusion because the Glomide Queen is the only other queen in Empyrean other than Marika we see anywhere in the lore, and a possible vessel of the Elden Ring, and thus the only possibility to be Placida Sax's consort. Except if we investigate the Glomide Queen herself, there is scant evidence of this connection. The Glomide Queen associated items and enemies are typically found in two places, the Divine Towers and places connected to Volcano Manor via snake rituals. As I've said in other videos, the Divine Towers themselves were built by the Giants or their allies. The fact that the two Godskin boss fights and the Queen's own sword 
are found in divine towers would indicate the Glomide Queen herself was a fire giant or allied to them in some way. Second, godskin bosses are found in Church of Igle in Volcano Manor and in Dalmanula Village. In both cases, we find them being worshipped in the context of pagan rites and birthing rituals involving snakes. The godskins themselves show snake-like movements in their boss fights, which may hint at their parentage. We hear in item descriptions that the godskins incorporated alien physiology. We also hear something similar from Rikard, who was incorporated by the serpent. This is described as similar to the crucible. It doesn't mean that it was the crucible. Godskin apostles display the same ability to stretch their torsos, similar to the snake men of Volcano Manor. So if the Glomide Queen had a lord, it was not Placidasax, but rather the serpent god or a previous lord similar to Rikard, who had been swallowed by the serpent. Neither of these tendencies show a cultural interchange with Pharaoh Mazala, the ancient dragons or beast men. The Glomide Queen appeared to be the head of a completely separate culture that, if anything, was opposed to Pharaoh Mazala and Placidasax. But there is one curious piece of evidence, the character of Vargram, said to be one of the earliest tarnished to ever enter the round table hold. He wields the Godslayer greatsword. His armor has an emblem on the back which is pretty clearly supposed to be Placidasax. This could mean he was loyal to both monarchs, creating the possibility of a union between them. Or it could mean he was a defector who fled Placidasax of service to protect the Glomite Queen. Other than this, I don't see much definitive evidence that the Glomide Queen was ever Placidasax's consort. So, we've happened upon three possible gods before the Age of the Erd Tree, the Twin Bird, the Sun Empyrean, and the Storm Empyrean. So in what order did the ages elapse? I think the earliest age has to be the Age of the Twin Bird. The Winged Great Horn, the item you get from trading in the remembrance of the regal ancestor spirit, has a rather interesting description. In the ancestral spirit-worshipping faith, these are considered envoys' wings, made to reap the lives of beings which experience no sprouting. From another item, the twin bird kite shield, we hear of another envoy who is also winged. This envoy is most likely the twin bird. Because the ancestral worshippers inhabit the ruins of a long-dead old dynasty and eschew the use of technology, I believe they provide a window into a prehistoric society. And since worship of the twin bird was part of the ancestral faith, this shows us that Fair Maslow's involvement in the lands between goes way back, possibly to the beginnings of civilization. The time frame of this age would have been massive, long enough for the followers of the twin bird to develop smithing and craft the sacrificial axe and other feathered talismans all the way to creating the twin bird kite shield. This is a fantasy world, stranger things have happened. The next possible candidate in the timeline would be the Empyrean from the Sun Realm of Castle Sol. I only say this because their civilization seems older than that of the Banished Knight clans that would come later. The only artifact of theirs which survives is the Sun Realm Shield. Yet those who live in death, all of whom appear to be former denizens or soldiers of the Sun Realm civilization, all display an early medieval level of technology. I don't want to guess the times of these ages, as that is impossible. And given that this is a fantasy world, technology doesn't really indicate time, as the laws of physics are completely different. The next Empyrean in line would be the Empyrean of the Ancient Storm from Stormvale Castle. We can see the transition from Sun Realm to Banished Night Rule by examining the environment of Castle Sol. The castle itself is inhabited by the spirits of long dead Banished Knights and Exiles, once loyal to the Stormhawk clan. But outside, we see the southern range of hills scattered with those who live in death, soldiers of the Sun Realm, arrayed almost like a defensive formation. From the physical evidence, we can conclude that the castle was stormed and taken over by banished knights. This takeover of Castle Soul marked a transition of power from the Sun Empyrean to the Storm Empyrean. This began the age of the banished knight clans, who built most of the forts and castles we see in the lands between. The saint and libation maiden statues are the marks of their empire, which is the one, I believe, which immediately preceded the age of the Erd Tree. Banished knights we encounter in Stormvale and elsewhere are descendants of the knights of this empire. Of the Banished Knight clans, I believe the Stormhawk clan was but one, from which the Storm Empyrean was born, who was giving us tribute to the Dragon Lord. In return for this trade, the Banished Knights were granted the power of the ancient dragons, and used it to expand their empire to every corner of the lands between. This is where we get into the heavy speculation portion of the video. The storms which hold up the ruins of Faramazala, I believe, are stark evidence of the conflict between Placidasax and the Storm Empyrean. 
The banished knights who inhabit the city came here as part of her honor guard when she came to or was given to Placidus Axe. I believe the union between the Empyrean and the Dragon Lord was not exactly consensual, being more a marriage of convenience done for political purposes. Therefore, she would have the motivation to summon the ancient storm to destroy the city and trap Placidus Axe beyond time. It is true the only cause we are given in the lore of Ferrum Asla's destruction is the Astal meteorite which produced the Ruins Greatsword. I still firmly believe that the storms of Ferrum Asla are the initial cause, and that they were summoned by Nefeli's ancestor, an Empyrean of the Ancient Storm. The next thing you might be wondering is, how does the Glomide Queen's reign factor into this timeline? I said before that I do not think she was one of Placidus X's consorts. I think the rise of the Glomide Queen coincided somehow with the end of the Banished Knight's empire and the shattering of Ferrum Asla. I believe she came to power during an interregnum, a time when there was no Elden Lord, a previous shattering, when there was all-out war in the lands between. We hear repeatedly of the god-slaying power of the Black Flame, yet we don't hear of any gods who are actually killed. There's no smoking gun, similar to the corpse of Godwin after the Night of the Black Knives. We still have no idea how she possessed the Rune of Death and Death, whether it was an inborn power as a result of being an Empyrean, or if she was ever a true vessel of the Elden Ring. The golden-hued eyes of the Godskins may hint at this, but all these are uncertain claims. I also think this interregnum period was the same as the Age of the Crucible we hear about from other item descriptions. The time of conflict which led into Godfrey and Merica's regime we know as the Age of the Erd Tree. But without getting too much off track, all this is the topic of another video. Right now I'll return to the introductory question. Who is the statue in Malekith's boss room? Surely she was one of Placida Sax's consorts. But which consort was she? The first clue to examine is the three wolves around her. Wolves themselves don't really count for much, you can find them in every area. Wolves are strongly associated with first generation Albanoric women. This connection seems too far fetched, as the Albanorics were most likely not around at the time, and I find it unlikely Dragonlord Placidus Axe would take an Albanoric as consort, but still something to think about. Is she the Tarnished who the Lone Wolves met? This would also make no sense since the Tarnished were not even around during Placidus Axe's time. In Stormvale Castle, one can see a design used on banners and on rugs, also on the scarves worn by the banished knights in Faram Azalon. This image shows a creature with the body of a bird and what looks like a wolf's head. Does this wolf-like sigil mean the statue is the Storm Empyrean from Castle Stormvale? Again, this seems like a far-fetched connection. The garb she wears looks similar to certain robes worn by aristocrats in the lands between. Namely, the consort's robe, the upper class robe, and the official's attire. This could mean she was definitely royalty and came from outside Farm Asla. We already kind of knew this already. There is also the flower in her ear. Credit to Eel to Eel from Discord for finding this out. It looks very similar to the flower of a pomegranate from Greek mythology. The pomegranate is associated with the goddess Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, who was abducted by Hades, the god of the dead. Pomegranate was the forbidden fruit she ate, unknowingly dooming her to live in Hades for all eternity. This somewhat fits my theory that Empyreans were abducted by Placidus Axe. The pomegranate flower could be a reference to Persephone. Still, this is a far-fetched connection since the flowers do not look exactly alike, and we don't necessarily know how or why the flower was put there. There is also the emblem found above the Empyrean statue. This is often referred to as an older version of the Elden Ring, which I agree with, Many lore hunters have tied the design of this emblem to the root system of the sacred tree in the lands between. While I think this is a valid observation, I'd like to raise some questions. If the Elden Ring emblem found in Malekith's boss room is supposed to represent the root system of the sacred tree, why are there no sacred tree roots in Ferrum Azala? We find the roots of normal trees. We also find death root, which some people say is a corrupted version of the earth tree's roots. Yet, if this Elden Ring really did center on the sacred tree or sacred root system, how can we find no trace of this in Ferrum Azala's terrain? So then, what does the emblem represent? I didn't mean to leave you with more questions than answers at the end of this video, but such is the nature of Elden Ring lore. I may be completely wrong about all of this. Until there is DLC, we won't have any definitive answers to these questions. This has been the Elden Conspiracy, signing out.